also want to greet my family. My family's, most of my family's out in Alberta, so they're probably going to be watching this tomorrow. I um, just want to thank my mom and my dad, and uh, my brother Abe and his wife Irma, and my brother Ben and his wife Tina for the continued prayer support and uh, for their encouragement throughout this time. So thank you. Um, as well as my family that is here as well. I got one brother that lives here in Ontario as well. But Yeah. <coughs> Good morning, everyone. I'm glad to see everyone come out, and I hope you all came to see what God might speak to you this day through all those who serve on a Sunday morning worship service. Whether it's a friendly handshake and a warm greeting from our amazing ushers back there, or through the worship team as they lead us in some awesome worship, or just in a conversation in the foyer from a fellow brother and sister in Christ or simply and most commonly from the ministerial team, deacons and pastors. I say all the others first because I think we limit God to speak only through those who preach and open in prayer and devotion. But if we look, God never ceases from speaking to his children. God has spoken to me in the, in the most mundane and simplest moments where there was no worship music playing, where there was no, the vibe wasn't churchy. You see, we dictate what our relationship is like with God. It's not that he's only in our midst when we invite him. He is always with us. He never leaves us. That is a promise of God. So we know that it is true. But I think that we don't want to bother him with anything other than our sins, our burdens, and, and uh, to ask for blessings. But I dare you to bother him with the mundane. I remember golfing a few, uh, golfing a few years back. And I hit my ball way off the tee box, way left. And I, see, I saw the flight path, and I was heading for a huge patch of grass way out there. And as I approached this overgrown grass, I was like, no way am I finding this ball. It's one inch by one inch white little ball amongst this grass. And then I remembered something I'd heard in a sermon a while ago on that day. And it was to pray about everything. So, you know what, whatever, I'm going to pray. If I find my ball, that's good, and I'm not going to gain a stroke. And if not, whatever. And so I prayed, and as I began to pray, I had heard directions in my head, left, right, straight, and so forth. And as the directions ceased, I opened my eyes and I looked down. The ball was right in front of my feet. So I think you might be surprised how wide God's shoulders are. There is room for the mundane on the shoulders of God. So with that, I'd like to greet you from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, to the church of God or Mount, in Corinth or in Mount Salem, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Here we are. Um, I had written down in my notes that there's excitement, but that all left. Now it's just nervousness. Um, but nervous, and I, f I feel like the excitement and nervousness have the same kind of feelings. But as my mother-in-law pointed out the other day, I was, I was out there a place that the nervousness has more of a weight in your stomach, and I would agree. It doesn't really bother me speaking in front of people. Um, you, you guys are just people. I'm just a person as well, and we're, no one's greater than the next. But... It is the weight of being a leader in this position and to adequ adequately portray this gospel message to both the lost and the found, both in word and in deed. And personally, I wasn't thinking, what if God doesn't speak to me about what I should write, but rather, but rather, what will God speak? And then to faithfully deliver what was given. So I've known for quite some time what my first sermon was going to be about. I remember three or four, three or four years ago, I was out back sitting with one of my mentees at the, underneath the pavilion. And I remember, I was going to, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. <clears throat> one of my mentees, and I remember telling him, man, if I ever become a pastor, I know exactly what my first message was going to be on. It was going to be about the grace of God. Shocker, eh? Every sermon you hear from behind this pulpit is saturated in the grace of God. And but 
I had just fully understood what grace, what the grace of God is, what it does, and it floored me. It wrecked me. I remember driving around at work from job site to job site, and I was just, I would just cry. I was crying. I must have looked ridiculous to other people. But when your life gets flipped upside down for the better, you don't care how you look to others. Because I now knew how I actually looked in the eyes of my creator, and I couldn't care less what other creations saw in me. I was freed. It brought me so much freedom to know how secure I actually was that the prince of life without stain was traded for the sinner. How loved I am and was by God. It also brought me humility because I now knew I had nothing to offer him in return for his salvation. That I am but a crippled beggar who was invited to the king of kings table to do nothing but to trust and enjoy him in spirit and in truth. And bow with me for a word of prayer. God, I thank you for this day. I thank you that, uh, that I am nervous. It just shows you that, that we all have our faults. We all have, we're not perfect. We're never going to be perfect. Not here on this earth, not on this side of heaven. But somehow you choose to use broken vessels. And I believe you use broken vessels because you put a light in a broken vessel and you see the light shine through the cracks. We all have our flaws. And somehow you've chosen me to to, uh, to do this. I would have never thought many years ago that I would be a pastor, that I would be preaching on a Sunday morning. Um, but you knew it. You wanted me for some reason. You called me for some reason. And I think I am thankful that your grace not only saves me, but it also sustains me through this, this moment. I just pray that my words could be heard and that my stumbling tongue would not, uh, would not stumble too much and that people can still hear what is being said on this day. Um, I, I confess my dependence upon you. I pray that, that I honor you in word and in deed uh, on this uh, Sunday morning and from this day forward as a leader here at SMC and the body of Christ. And thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. So I've been raised in a Christian house my whole life. So, you know, I was raised with godly morals. I was bad, but I wasn't like, like bad, bad, right? <laughs> I was kind of like a good bad. I wasn't out there wilding out and fighting and cussing people out and hardcore partying. But it's funny how that's even a thing, like good, bad. It's like we don't, like, it's like we put levels to this in our hearts and in our minds. Like, have you ever said that's said some, said have you ever heard someone say, I just told a little white lie? There's no such thing. It doesn't give it. Like, we look at other people and judge them, and man, if, if they're out there, like I said, I was, I was bad, but, but, you know, good bad, but I was still dishonest. I was still, I, I, st I still stole. I still had a nasty attitude. I was still looking at pornography. I was disobedient. I had all these natural tendencies but when I became a believer, I had, some, I had the same attitude come up. And now, like I would, now, like if I would fall and mess up, but it would be like, a, a, be like self-righteous with it, where it's like, yes, we've all fallen, fallen short of the glory of God, but I don't fall as much as the next person. That's what, that was my mentality. But as you see, levels. As I began to understand grace more, it didn't matter from the little white lie, which there's no such thing, it's a lie, to the person that murdered someone. We all needed the grace of God. You see, see, I think this is one of the fundamental problems we have in our Christian faith across the world. See, the levels to our sin, levels to our faith, levels to our outward devotion, levels to how many scriptures we post to our social media, we categorize people on how far they are from God or how close you are to God. Have you ever said or thought about someone else that, man, they're really out there living in the world? Like you could be doing something and it's not that bad, but they're doing something that's a little bit further than what you would do. 
so they are out there compared to you, yourself. It's like we think that God is more pleased with me based solely on our physical circumstances, blessings. So if my circumstance is good, that means God's blessing me. And if your circumstance is bad, you're, you're not getting blessed. So somehow I must be a gauge of God's goodness. Because I wouldn't do that. And God's blessing me, and you're doing that. And God's not blessing you, so somehow I've become a measuring stick of God's goodness. But it was years that I carried myself like that and had those preconceived notions towards others, feeling like the guy feeling like the guy in a homosexual relationship and the murderer that I'm better than them. Like my sin only cost a few drops of Christ's blood compared to the next guys that needed a whole pint. You got to get that out of our mind. The smallest white lie is enough to be indictable. And hell is the only relevant response to a righteous reaction from a righteous judge, God. And as I sat back earlier this week, I had a thought I've never had. And it was that, you know, God's smart. You ever thought that? Like, I know that God is omniscient, but I get lost in those fancy words sometimes. But nonetheless, God is smart. Like, I love how he leveled the playing field in regards to sin on his Sermon on the Mount. If you hate your brother, he counts it on par with murder. Likewise, adultery. I mean, likewise, uh, looking, at any, looking at someone with lust, consider it as adultery. You remember, good, bad, here on the sermon, in, on the mount, Jesus himself says, yeah, nope, that's not good enough. That's just not going to cut it out. When my standard is sheer perfection. He actually says in Matthew 5, 20, um, for I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes, and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So let's talk about grace. What it is, what it isn't, and what it does. I'm actually quite terrified to preach this because I believe it will expose some of our beliefs a little more. I'm just going to take this jacket off. It is hot up here for some reason. (laughs) It will expose our beliefs a little more and it might push us to let go of things and actually let amazing grace into our heart and into our mess and our religious activity. You see, it was my fear that we, the church, capital C, the body of of Christ, don't understand grace. How many people in this room or people that you know are performance-based, perfection-driven? How many of us are keeping ourselves hostage to something we did in our past? How many of us have a fear of failure or not measuring up? And as a result, we live depressed and discouraged. That is what is happening to the church, to those who have put their faith in Jesus. It tells me, it lets me know that we don't understand grace because we still think somehow it's still about our works that makes us right with God. If that's us, it puts us in a dangerous position with the enemy. That he can easily manipulate us that somehow, after you received God's grace for free, that now you have to perform to keep it. That's one of the reasons we see people burn out or you see people serve God out of fear because we think we got to do all this stuff to make God happy. We got to do all this stuff to keep him on our good side because we fear that the father that once adopted us will throw us out. But Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 7 says, and most of my scripture that I've written down is all out of the NESB, says, but God being rich in mercy because all of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ and raised us up with him and seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. He cannot remove you from Christ. We are seated with him, and the reason we are seated 
is because the work is done. There is nothing left to do. There's nothing that, that can attain us any more righteousness than what we have in Christ Jesus already. Colossians chapter 3, verse 3 says, For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And if we are hidden in Christ, then he, can, he cannot deny himself, as Second Timothy says. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. And my main scripture today is um, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of your works. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. I heard a pastor on YouTube describe grace like this, that we're all in a boat, and there's a current drawing us to hell. But then God steps in and gives, you, gives us oars, and as long as you keep rowing against the current that's drawing you to hell, you'll make it to heaven. He said, grace is the divine enablement to keep on rowing. And many people would agree with that, but then I'd know you don't understand grace. Because that wouldn't be amazing grace, because it would be our own efforts, therefore we could boast. Ephesians says that there that not of your works, not of yourselves, so that you can't boast. And he went on to say that, you see, I think the church has missed it. He pulled 100 pastors and asked them, what is grace? And they said something like, the unmerited favor of God. He's, yeah, but 10% said, it's the divine enablement to live a new life. Again, he said, I think we've missed it. But, you know, it sounds kind of right, but if you circle back to his question, what grace does, not what grace is. Grace does empower you to live a new life. It does break you free from the bondage we've placed on ourselves. Grace does help us to say no to temptation. But grace is the unmerited, undeserved, unearned kindness and favor of God. There is nothing we can do to make God give us his grace or more of it. He died while we were still his enemy and dead in our transgressions. Now let's read Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 now, again. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not a result of your works, so that no one may boast. Now I want to read it again in two other versions, uh, the one version being the message, and the other being amplified, because I like how redundant it gets with its reading. It just gets better and better. The message version says, Now God has us right where he wants us, with all the time in this world and the next, to shower grace and kindness on us in Christ Jesus. Saving is all his idea, and it is all his work. All we do is trust him enough to let him do it. It's God's gift from start to finish. We don't play a major role in it. If we did, we'd probably go around bragging that we'd done the whole thing. No, we neither make nor save ourselves. God does both the making and the saving. I love the message version because it reads like we talk in our, in our day and age. Now, I want to read out of the Amplified. And if you've never heard of the Amplified before, its name, its name is what it does. It amplifies the passage like crazy. So again, Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verses 8 and 9 in the Amplified. For it is by grace, God's remarkable compassion and favor drawing you to Christ, that you have been saved, actually delivered from judgment, and given eternal life through faith. And this salvation is not of yourselves, not through your own effort, but it is the undeserved, gracious gift of God not as a result of your works nor your attempts to keep the law so that no one will be able to boast or take credit in any way for his salvation. You see, it's being very redundant in these two versions. It's screaming at us just to stop. Stop it. It's not of yourselves because you can't do it. That is why Jesus had to die in our place. 
Like it's funny how in the beginning of our salvation, we were amazed by the grace that he would save a wretch like me, that he would take all of my yuck, all of my sin, and we're just amazed by the thought of this undeserved love and forgiveness. But over time, it turns into my good deeds. Yeah, I used to be like that. But look at me now. I'm serving now. And like God makes, like God makes me a little higher on his godly chart than the next guy. Pastor Jake's message last Sunday out of Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 and 22, where Jesus says that not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Did we not do all these things in your name? It reminds me about a brief conversation I had with, with Father one day a few years ago as we were on our way to church. Father asked me, what if I don't let you into heaven? And without skipping a beat, I was just about to throw the list of my filthy rags in God's face because our own righteousness that we can conjure up is as filthy rags to him. God said, check, and I had to realign why I was giving out of myself and that it made me no better than the next guy who does nothing, equal in the eyes of God. And this is a hard thing because to the performance-based guy, it means that I can't work my way ahead of the next guy and God's love will not increase because of your good deeds. I'm reminded of the prodigal son story in Luke chapter 15. Um, chapter 15, yeah, verse, beginning in verse 11. Um, the prodigal son, he said, Jesus said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now, when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country and he began to, in, to be impoverished. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of the country and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods of the swine were eating and no one was giving because no one was giving him anything. But when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I'm dying here with hunger. And I want us to just stop there for a second. So, so the scripture says here, he says, he look, sounds like he spent it all on loose living and you name it, he probably did it and he probably did it twice. So he spent it all and needed something to survive. So he hired himself out to a swine farmer. And it's interesting that Jesus uses this as his example. It could have been anything else. It could have been sheep, cattle, but he chose to use the pig as his example. I wonder if there is something else to that in there. The pig unclean, Gentile unclean. This was still Old Covenant. Jesus hadn't died yet, so he's, still dro he's dropping little things like this throughout his ministry to show that he will be drawing all men to him. So he worked for the farmer, and as he was out in the field, he thought to himself that even the food that the pigs were eating began to look like something that was desirable because no one was giving anything to him. Verse 17 says, but when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I am dying here with hunger. I love it. It says when he came to his senses because he already knew that his father was good, but his perception was altered when he was at home. Enticed by the things of the world and then seduced by it later on. Who knows how long it was, it doesn't say. But the truth never changed. The truth was that father is good and that he was a righteous man who treated his servants more f more than fair let's bring that back to our day and age 
Now that God, we know that God is a good, good father. We sing songs about it. And if it, and if it isn't our perception, then we act contrary to the truth. I'm going to say it like this. If we don't perceive God right, and he is, that he is a good, good father, but rather that he is just waiting for you to sin so he can condemn you and heap nasty consequences on you, you're going to avoid a God like that. You're not going to commune with him. You're not going to go to his house in church. You're not going to share your burdens with him. You're going to try to clean yourself first. You'll, re you'll result to the law, back to the law. But the law is like a mirror. The mirror can show you that you are dirty, but you don't take the mirror off and clean yourself with the mirror. You turn the tap on. And you wash it, and you wash. Now let's look at the father in this story. Verses, I stopped at 17, but verses 20 and 22. So he got up and came to his father, the prodigal son. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran. That alone will mess up your religion, that God ran to his son. He ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to the father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And in verse 22, he messes me up. But the father said to the slaves, quickly, bring out the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. It's like he straight up ignores his apology, doesn't even respond did not tell him to clean up first. You've been in the muck with pigs. Who knows what else unclean thing you have been around or involved with. He simply received him. From death, i.e. separation, and brought him to life. Like, if you've committed any, any of these heinous sins that we like to that we like to think that other people do that is worse than ours like adultery murder um i don't know whatever you want to throw on the list god doesn't throw you away nor does he keep you hostage to your past but you've got to let amazing grace in and let god heal you and transform you Verses 27 and 30 in Luke 15. Um, he said to him, the, the brother, he said to him, your brother has come. He said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But then the, then the son, not the, not the prodigal son, but the other son, became angry and was not willing to go in. And his father came out and began pleading with him. But he answered and he said to his father, look, so many years I have been serving you and I have never neglected a command of yours. And yet you have never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when, the son, when this son of yours, not even his brother, when this son of yours, Cain, who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him? And he said to him, son, you have always been with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we, have, but we had to celebrate and rejoice, for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live and was lost and has been found. This is where I wanted to get to, to the brother. I wonder man, how many of us have the same mentality. He became angry. He refused to join the celebration that, that his brother was lost. And now, his, now that his brother was received back to life, he refused to celebrate. Caught up in his deeds to the father, he forgot to enjoy the father. The father says, everything I've ever had was yours. You could have thrown a party whenever you wanted to. But no, he stayed in his works 
because he wouldn't, because he wasn't going to be like his brother who left them behind, neglected the farm or wherever or whatever they had, and squandered his life. So he stayed dedicated, not dependent. And it's I thought for sure this was way longer than when I was preparing this, but you know what? I I guess one day I'll get better at this and maybe the, the sermons will be a little longer, but for now I'll be your favorite pastor and your sermons are going to be short when you have me. <laughs> but I'm going to, I would like to close this and it might seem weird to close it with, with this, but I'd like to close with John, uh, the Gospel of John, John 8, verses 1 through 11. Hmm. Um, many of you probably know the story it's the, the adulterous woman but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives early in the morning he came again into the temple and all the people were coming to him and he sat down and began to teach them the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery and having set her in the center of the court they said to him teacher this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. Now the law of Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. What then do you say? They were saying this, testing him, so that they might have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. Straight up ignored them. But when they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. And again, stooped down and wrote on the, sand, on the ground. And when they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones. And he was left alone with the woman where she was in the center of the court. Straightening up, Jesus said to her, woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go from now and sin no more. In verse, in verse 7, again, you see Jesus leveling the playing field with, from adultery to addiction, greed, to homosexuality, gossip, gluttony, dishonesty, unrighteous anger, whatever you want to throw on this list, level in the eyes of God. And the only one able and righteous enough to throw stones doesn't. In, uh, is it? in verse 10, straightening up, Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go from now on, sin no more. Those words, I do not condemn you either, should be screaming in the hearts of believers. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. As Romans 8, chapter 8, verse 1 says, this woman had just encountered the grace of God, and she did nothing to deserve it. She did nothing to earn it. And the only thing she could do in that moment is receive the kindness and favor of God. And notice how she didn't even, she wasn't even pleading for forgiveness. Like the prodigal son, the father seemed to ignore his apology. While you were his enemy, he extended his grace to you and to everyone in the whole world. The ball is in our hands, so to speak. Are we going to come and receive this grace that not only saves, no, sorry, not we're going to come, are we going to come to our senses and go to the Father and share our burdens or are we going to keep our guard up and stay on defense rather than to receive this grace that not only saves us, but also sustains us throughout our lives? Um, 
that is all I have prepared for today. Um, so with that, if you want to pray, rather standing, sitting, kneeling, whatever you want to do, just bow for a silent word of prayer. God, I thank you that you hear us. You are near to us. You are not distant. You wait for us to return like the prodigal son. It says that as he was afar away off, you ran to him. It is your heart. It is your heart exposed to us. And we mess it up with our, with our works and with our deeds. We try to attain this righteousness through ourselves. We need you every day, every hour, every minute. We cannot sustain ourselves. We cannot make ourselves look any better than we are in the eyes of you right now. And it's all because of your son's work. We trust in you. We thank you. And we worship you not only today on this Sunday morning worship service, but throughout the weeks to come. Thank you that you've given me the opportunity to share this short message, and it is something that I've never done before. This is my first time, and I'm grateful for your sustaining love and grace. In Jesus' name we pray. So I'm going to close in benediction now, or you do it after worship? I can't remember. Okay. Ephesians chapter 3. Verses 20 to 21. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever.